You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. Hello and welcome to another Viva Italiano <laughs> wine-packed episode of Two Guys and a Lot of Wine. I'm Bobby P. And I'm James Kimbro. And we are doing something Jim and I have never done on the show before. We're going into tasting three wines that neither he nor I has pre-tested okay. at all. Usually that's never been done on the show. Either one no. of us has tasted at least one of them. And I was I'm very nostalgic for Italy sometimes, ever since Tony's been on the show. And I just happened to catch one of my favorite episodes of Everybody Loves Raymond when they were traveling to Italy. And I had an epiphany. I said, Bob, you got to do another few Italian wines that Tony did not cover from two regions that he didn't cover. Um, and these will be from Tuscany, the Diabrugio region, and just to be a little quirky, a Chilean 100% Cabernet Sauvignon Rosé. And I got to be honest with you, when I went into the store, I had no intention of buying any of these three wines that you see on the table. But my friend who works there he came up to me and said, Bob, 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 you got to try these wines. I don't have time to give you a taste, but take my word for it. At the price point, you guys are going to love them. And if you don't, well, I'm sorry. Just don't say I sold them to you. <laughs> but I will say he sold them to me, and I'm very excited about tasting these tonight. Now you broke my number one rule of thumb, I did. Bob. I try sure it did. before you buy it. Well, you know, Jim, generally I wouldn't do it either. But once again, between the Everybody Loves Raymond show and the nostalgia towards the Tony show and I was just feeling very Italiano. Yeah. I said, I'm going to do it. So well, you're following my other rule of thumb, which is drink what you like. So I, I'm going to give you some credit here. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm hoping the credit is just dessert, <laughs> or you might pour one of those bottles over my head before the night's <laughs> over. That's not going to happen. <laughs> and tonight, uh, I'm bringing a new product onto the show also. Um, these are wine crackers. And I encourage people when they go to wine tastings, you know, they're trying so many different wines throughout the day. Uh, the palate kind of gets confused after a while. Mm -hmm. you, know, you taste some reds, you taste some sweeter stuff, and then you go to a different tasting and you're trying some whites all over again, and your, your mouth is just overwhelmed at that point. So the best way to kind of cleanse the palate is to use uh, a wine cracker like this. So tonight, Which is better than water. Generally. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, this will dry out the mouth and give you a neutral palate. Uh, that way, when you go on to the next wine, it, it's almost like you're starting from, fre from scratch. You've got a, a fresh palate ready to, to taste a new wine. So. And I, I think it's been a while since either we've used those at a party or even I've used them. And we tested, tested, tasted them or tested them a little bit before the show. And they do really dry your mouth out very quickly. It's almost like the, the moisture just evaporates instantly. So we'll, we'll give this a shot in between each wine tonight. That might be that. our most pleasurable uh, taste <laughs> uh, this evening. So let's hope that's not the case. But uh, anyways, the first wine, which who doesn't love the Tuscan area of Italy? You know, there's been stories written, there's been movies made, and there's a lot of wine made in that area. And since Tony did not cover a wine from the Tuscany region, we are going to be tasting a wine from the Tuscany region. And that's why we keep doing this show. There are so many great regions and so many great wines. We're just, and, we, have just, uh, we have to do a lot of shows to get through all those great regions. So. And I think the, the varietal grape for this one is the Sangiovese. Grape, I think, uh, is the most prevalent mm -hmm. one in most wines from Tuscany, though it can incorporate some other uh, grapes right. as well. Yeah, and if, you, if you're drinking a Chianti, that's the Sangiovese grape also. And as Tony said, and which I think some of our viewers might have forgot, generally when you're buying an Italian wine, the label is not the, usually the grape varietal. It's from the region uh, right. that the wine right. is it's coming from. It's just like France. Uh, they're not going to market the wine based on the grape varietal. They're going to market it based on the region where it's grown. So, so you have to know your regions and have, you have to know what they grow in every region. And this is a 2006 Sensi, and that is the actual vineyard. It's, I think it's about a 150-year-old vineyard in the Tuscany region. And it's, I did a quick research online before coming in tonight. And they've been around a long time. They have won a lot of awards. And 
Let's see if our palettes are awarded this evening. I can see right no. off the bat, that's quite a color. It's a very, very dark color, uh, darker than plum. Hmm. I get kind of a, a date smell off of this. Yeah, I would agree with you. Maybe a cherry, yep. a cherry flavor, a black cherry flavor, yep. or black cherry, black cherry snack scent. Wow, that's not bad. I, you know, I get a lot of uh, watery taste with this, and then the fruit comes through towards the end. You know, I agree with you. I think you, it, you don't, it doesn't hit you at first. No. But as it starts going down, your whole back palate sort of gets a lot of different sensations. It's, uh, yeah, it's kind of clinging to the middle of my tongue. I'm not, it, it's not going to the back of the mouth or the back of the throat, but it's, it's staying in the middle of the mouth. Which is unusual because usually, you know, when you when you have a wine that has a, a fin finish that lingers like this, it's going all the way down the back of the tongue. I can still taste it a yeah. little bit. You I know, too. Yeah, it's obvious that we don't have Tony's wines to compare this particular red with, but um, and I'm not going to get into the price points until near the end of the show. But I think this is right off the bat typical of an Italian wine. I like it. It's it's very easy drinking. Yeah, more but it's and not as. Um, Simple as a Chianti. There's mm -hmm. a little bit more character going on in here. Yeah, the, the Chiantis, uh, a lot of the Chiantis have never appealed to me. Um, and this one has a lot more character, and you, you get a little bit of the fruit taste with this, which I don't, I don't find with the Chiantis. I, think, I, I find them to be very harsh wines um, and a very harsh finish, typically. Um, so this, refresh my memory, what kind of, this is 100% Chianti, or is this a blend? This, I believe, is a 100%. Okay. 100%. I'm surprised. I'm yep. really surprised they got this kind of flavor out of 100% uh, Sangiovese. Well, that's why uh, my friend at the store said that, you know, they had tasted these and they were very excited about getting them in. And I'll go into where you can get these if we both agree at the end that they're good enough to recommend. And um, he said that for the price point, you know, they're going to fly out of the store, but they have a good supply that should mm -hmm. be around for at least a couple months, depending on if people like us buy them all out. But um, <laughs> it might be gone tomorrow. <laughs> I can see what he means. A, a wine from Tuscany, like I said, I mean, generally a lot of people are, aren't familiar with a lot of Italian mm -hmm. wines. But I think right off the bat, if this is the way the evening is going to go, uh, we're off to a good, oh, excellent start. start. Excellent start. So, he, and he just got these in. He has not had these in the store before. They had literally just gone. They had done a tasting, I think, uh, you know, a couple weeks prior for all three of these. I guess, mm -hmm. you know, that's what they did. And they purchased not just these three, but a bunch of other stuff. But he knows about the show we did on Italian wine. And when he saw me, he just immediately came up to me and said that he had some Italian wines that he thinks... He wanted something back on this show. <laughs> uh, you, know, you know, it's a competing liquor store, so I say that, look, I will do that. But if they're not good, i got to be honest with you, I'm going to let people know. So, so far, he has earned his little red star. And uh, Viva Italiano is thumbs up. For me, for number one at least. And you're going to wait till the end for the price points. Aren't yes, you? I think they might shock you. And okay. that's, I don't want to give you, shouldn't even have said that, but uh, I was very pleasantly surprised. All right. But once again, I do think there's a lot of uh, character quality in this uh, first one. The bricky color is really almost earthy color. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I'm getting some sediment in the bottom mm -hmm. here, which is not a problem. I, that does not indicate a bad wine. Uh, this just is, this is a, a bottle that you'd want to strain before pouring. So if you have a decanter at home and you've, you've brought yours in before. That's correct. Uh, decant the wine and then put a, a metal strainer on the top of the decanter and that'll catch all the sediment. And this is an 06, which was a very good year for that region from what he told me. Mm -hmm. And it uh, was a very popular year for the grape in that particular area. So that could be another reason that, um, you know, a little bit more earthy character going on at the bottom of the glass because it's been sitting in that bottle for six years. Well, they've aged this quite well. I will say that it probably should have been open a little bit longer, but I'm very happy with that first one. Very happy indeed. Yeah, no, I don't think that needed to breathe anymore. This is, uh, it's, it's showing its character right now. It's, yeah, I'm really enjoying it. Now, the other thing I'm a little concerned about, because we didn't think about this until I opened up the bottle, is we were talking about this. There is sediment. There is sediment. You and have to set this one aside. We'll have to set this one aside and use a fresh glass for the next one. After we have... We're going to try a wine cracker. Cleanse your palate. Thank you, kind sir. And this will ensure that we get to fully appreciate the second wine without the first wine competing with uh, the, the, what's going on in our mouth right now. 
Well, wine number two, I've been practicing this for the last few hours, and I'm looking forward to saying it. Monte Pulciano di Abruzzo. Pretty good. Our Italian <laughs> viewers out there, I apologize if I did not get that right, but trust me, my heart today is Italian. And the grape varietal is the Monte Pulciano grape, I believe, and it's from the di Abruzzo region of Italy, another area that produces a lot of high-quality wines, wines from all different for all different price points. And <clears throat> this is a 2009. Mm -hmm. And again, you haven't tried this. I haven't tried this. Strictly uh, by the confident voting of my wine guy to buy it. This is very similar in color to the last one we had. I think uh, there's a little bit more purple. There is, I was just gonna say, there's a little more purple in this, but there's still you know, the, the dark brown base to it. Got some very good legs. Completely different scent than the first one, which is another mm -hmm. great reason of when you guys um, look at these bottles and you decide to buy them and either taste with us or taste on your own, really different characteristics right off the bat for the this, scent. This is more like uh, typical Italian wine to me, for, just from the nose. You get, uh, it's, it's kind of a gamey barnyard smell. And again, not that that's a bad thing, that's just a, a description uh, that they typically throw out for this kind of wine. Right off the bat, completely different taste. Not a lot of tannins in this at all. I well, think it, I, I get a little tannin at the finish, but you're right. It's not, it's not an overwhelming sensation at all. But I think it's a full-bodied one. I mean, I think there's a, it sort of opens up once it's on your, on your tongue. Yeah, when you compare this to the first wine, you know, the first wine had that watery start, mm -hmm. and you don't really get that with this wine. And this is a wine I think that doesn't even need to be opened up or let breathe for any length mm -hmm. of time. I think it's probably what you're going to get even after it's been sitting out for a few hours. I agree. The, um, yeah, most of the, the flavor is coming through in the middle as well as some of the, um, the acid. And then it just fades away. It's, there's, there's, nothing, there's almost no finish at all with this one. And I want to say it again, if I can do it properly, the Manto Pusciano grape varietal. Yeah. And once again, I, that might be a little off. I know where my heart is this evening. We'll, uh, we'll get some messages on Facebook, I'm sure. Have you had a particular, have you had that grape variety from Italy? Uh, I've, you know what, I have an Italian neighbor and she's been recommending Montepucciano's to me for quite a while. And I have, because I'm a little biased towards other regions of the world, I have not really gone out and explored Montepucciano's, but uh, I've, I've heard of them and I've tried one or two uh, when, when she's had me over for drinks, so. Well, I found out, from both Tony show and drinking myself Italian wines, that they are their own unique character um, persona. Completely different, I think, than French wines and uh, other varieties. Right, and that's, uh, that's the great thing about wine, though, is you know, every region of the world has its own little twist on how to produce the wine and, and what kind of character they're trying to put into the wine. So you're, you're gonna get a different taste and a different flavor from Italy than you would from France and you would from South Africa or South America, for that matter. Not a lot of bitter aftertaste or mm -hmm. anything at all. Another example of another Italian wine that's very easy to drink, but not watery. No. No, and it's, and it's not harsh. You know, a lot of the, and this is the problem again that I have with Sangioveses and Chiantis is that they tend to be harsh. And the reason for that is that they're designed to be consumed with food, uh, specifically highly acidic food like tomatoes. Uh, you think of Italian food and it's all, you know, tomato based, the marinara sauce, the, uh, the pasta. Uh, and once you start to eat those foods and drink the wine with it, the wine kind of mellows out. And so that's, that's why the Italians make the wines as, uh, as harsh as they do. Um, so when you go to a wine tasting like I do and there's no food available, you're just drinking the wine on its own, it's not really a fair judgment of how the wine is going to taste when it's paired with the right food. That's true. And I, I've been to a couple of Italian wine tastings. I think I did one over the summer at Max's or Max Beverages mm -hmm. for an Italian. And you know these were high-priced Italian wines, but even the, uh, the gentleman doing the wine tasting said, you know, it's sometimes difficult to compare an Italian wine without actually eating some food with it. Right, right, so. and that's that's just the way they make the wines. I mean, if you have a, a California uh, cab, you know, that's a big, bold, fruity wine that's meant to be consumed by itself. It, granted, it will pair well with a lot of foods, but they grow it and produce it uh, specifically for you to drink a glass of it by itself. Yeah. Not that you can't drink either one of these so far by themselves. 
Um, but I think, uh, like any other wine, sometimes having the right food with it would make it better. But I'm impressed. I'm impressed. I think you'll be impressed too. But uh, when I tell you what the price point is compared to what Tony's were, and because generally, like I said, you know, it, we try to keep things under a certain price point. But um, I got to give them credit. I think uh, these might be two that I'm going to go buy, maybe a, another half case of just to keep on hand for mm -hmm. future uh, dinner and get together, or maybe even for New Year's coming up. Uh, throw one in if we have some good meat at our New Year's party. So the, you're you're giving your Friend, the thumbs up already, or you're going to do the thumbs up at the end of the show? Oh, no, I'm giving the thumbs up on that okay. one right off the All bat. Right. Um, but don't let that jade you, Jim. If you want to say, eh, eh, eh. Uh, You know what? I'm giving it a half thumb for right now, but it's only because I'm probably not eating the right food with this. Fair enough. Remember, we, uh, we strive for differences sometimes. So. All right. We're going to try another wine cracker. Cleanse the palate one more time. Now, as some of you know, I've been stuck on this rosé kick since the West Hartford Gala. And I've been trying to get both my friends and the viewers out there to give rosés a chance because I still find, even this time of year, a good rosé is just as enjoyable as a white or mm -hmm. a red. I agree. And this one, the Aquina from Chile near the uh, Rapel Valley, is a 100% Cabernet Sauvignon blend. It's not even a blend. It says 100% Cabernet Sauvignon. This is all cab. All cab. Now, people are going to ask, how did they turn cab, which is normally a red wine, into a rosé? They will. And what happens during uh, the winemaking process is uh, if the grapes get crushed and they leave the skins in with the juice, the skins impart a lot of uh, color to the wine. So that's where you get a deep, dark red color if they leave the skins in for quite a while. If they crush them um, and immediately pull the skins out, you're not going to get any color at all. And if they, if they leave them in for just a brief amount of time and then pull them out, that's when you start to get the rosés. Um, and you'll see a lot of different colors of rosé. You'll see a, a light rosé, a pale pink, um, and then it, it goes to you know, almost a, a ruby color. Um, but those are still rosés rather than a red wine. So the, the longer they leave the skins in with the juice uh, determines how much color you get out of the rosé. And it's interesting because I think we covered a little of that on our crossover show we did with Mr. Science. Uh, yes, we did. When he asked about what gives wine their color. And uh, Jim was completely 100% right when he talked about the skins of the grape mm -hmm. and how long they either left in or taken out to create what we have in our hand right here. So if you followed us across to that other show, you would have already heard that speech, but you, I'm happy to give it again. Yes. <laughs> um, well, here we go, because the last rosé we tasted on the show was a French rosé. That was the Malbec rosé. Mm -hmm that was served both at the West Hartford Gala and to family and friends, and still to mixed results. So I'm very excited about this one. I am too, and you can see already some great legs on this. Absolutely, nothing watery about this one. No, and it's, it's a darker rosé. You know, most rosés that uh, we tend to drink are, are a paler pinkish kind of color, but this, uh, this has a little more depth to it. And I, I get uh, some kind of apricot scent on the nose here. I get a little honey on this one. You know what? I'm going to say honeysuckle, Ooh. which is, <laughs> and a lot of people out there aren't familiar with these, uh, with the honeysuckle, but it's, it's actually a plant uh, where you pick the stem out and just suck on it. And it has a kind of a honey characteristic to it, but it's a very, very subtle taste. So if, if you think of honey and then think of honeysuckle, the honeysuckle is a lot subtler than a regular honey flavor. So that, that, and I, I don't get an overwhelming sense of honey with this, but it, it's right there in the background. So I'm going to say honey. A little plummy too, I think. There might be a little plum flavor in that. Mm -hmm. But I could tell you right off the bat for this one, I enjoyed the Malbec, the French Malbec Rosé that we had last time both here and at the gala and that I've been using for the last several months. This one has more character. It has more flavor than the uh, French Malbec. Now, obviously, two different grape varietals. Um, but I think there's, for a rosé, this is much more flavorful than mm -hmm. I was expecting. Yeah, I was much. I was really expecting something a little on the sort of not bland, but sort of the mellow side. That's what I was expecting, and that's uh, a lot of people have that impression when they think of rosés. But there is a lot more character in this wine. You're right. Uh, I get a lot more of the fruit. Uh, it's still kind of. It has a, a somewhat weak finish, which is what you expect from rosés. Uh, but this is. It's delicious. What's great about this particular rosé, and um, maybe Jim will agree with me, maybe he won't. This has been sitting for about an hour. And even at the temperature that it's currently at mm -hmm. for a rosé, it is still extremely drinkable. 
It is. It's a little warm for rosé, but I, uh, it's not unpleasant at all. I'm really enjoying this. I'm going to guess that's also because it's a 100% Cabernet Sauvignon, so you're still getting some of the uh, benefit of that rather than right. some kind of blend. Yeah, and I, I was just looking uh, the other day. It's funny you mentioned temperature because I was looking at a temperature chart the other day, and there are people who get so nitpicky about the, pro the appropriate temperature to serve a wine. Uh, they have listed by degree in Fahrenheit every grape varietal and, and where it ranks on this chart. And so they had, you know, they had 20 different grape varietals and 20 different Fahrenheit temperatures at which to serve these. And it was, you know, it was one temperature apart, and it went you know, from 42 degrees up to 60 degrees Fahrenheit for these different varietals. I gotta tell you, I've been at some very exclusive wine tastings, and if I had to go to a wine tasting where I had to drink a wine at the exact temperature it was supposed to be, <laughs> Bobby I, P would not be enjoying himself. I, you know, I don't mind drinking it at the right temperature, but being responsible for serving it at the right temperature, that's where this gets irritating. Well said, yeah. well said. You can serve me anything yeah. by having me responsible for serving it to the wine snob at the right temperature. Well, right. yeah, that's not in our repertoire. And, and it's, it's really not possible for the, the average wine consumer. Uh, you know, I have a wine refrigerator at home, which, is, uh, which has two zones. So I can set one side for a cooler temperature for the whites and the rosés, and another side, uh, the other side is uh, for reds, which is at a higher temperature. But if I were to have you know, 10 different wine varietals at 10 different temperatures, I'd need five more refrigerators. And you probably weigh 50 pounds from running back and forth to yeah. uh, <laughs> try to serve them. So. But uh, once again, I'm going to say, this is my bias towards a rosé this year, wow and thumbs up big time for the Aquino from Chile. I'm going to give this a thumbs up also. Um, yeah, people who don't tend to gravitate towards rosés might want to try this one first and, and then kind of branch out from there. This, I think this is a very good first rosé to, to start with. Actually, I wish I had tasted this or knew about this prior to the uh, infamous Malbec rosé that I French, from French, uh, the French one, because if I had tasted this one, I probably would have bought two cases of this. Mm -hmm. As it is, I bought one case of the Malbec, so I'm still sitting on about six bottles of that one, which is still good, but yeah. I'm going back for more I, of that. Yeah, and you should. That's a great one. All right, let's, let's clean, talk price. Well, let's clean the palate Oh, you want to clean the palate. All right. Because that's where I'm, it's going to get interesting. I'm dying to know how much these cost. And actually, we're going to go back and taste the first one. Actually, we'll do a small tasting, and I'll give the price of each one as we do another small sip. Okay. The wine from Tuscany, that beautiful brick color, the heavy character, nice full flavor in your mouth, mm -hmm. under $9. You're kidding. Now, I must preface that by saying that's for a limited time. It's a special buyout. They bought quite a lot of them. So if you want to taste this wine, when you see this show, it's going to be January. January. They bought quite a lot of it. I would highly recommend you get down to Liquor Depot, either in Avon or uh, New Britain, and buy this one at that price point. I, I can't believe it's that inexpensive. I looked it up online, and it generally is twice that price. So, and, and that's what I was expecting to pay for this. I thought this was going to be $18, $19. Yep. Man. So he did good on the first one. He, he did phenomenal. phenomenal. I'm giving this a big thumbs up. Yeah, even after that sat a little bit, this go, we're going back to our second tasting. Mm-hmm. That's just a great, nice drinking wine. Yeah, I, this, is, this is the type of wine, and normally when I drink wines, you know, I like to taste a lot of different wines throughout the evening. Um, so, you know, start off with some sparkling, do a little uh, white, uh, you know, some kind of Sauvignon Blanc or Moscato, and then move into the reds. I could drink this all night long. It's, it's that good. I find it that interesting. He assured me that at the price point that wine is, the Tusc Tuscany wine, you cannot touch that anywhere in the state that quality right now. No. So by the time you see the show, I hope there's still some left. Please go down and get some. Do you know the ratings for these, or have these even been rated? These, neither, none of these three have been rated. Okay. Uh, if they have been, I did some quick research. I didn't find anything other than the fact that they're very popular yeah. in their home country. But that oftentimes, that affects the price of the wine. If it, if it gets rated, suddenly the price jumps. And if it gets rated above 90 points, it really jumps. Sure does. So I always coach people, you know, if you're looking for a wine that has some kind of rating, Go for a wine that has an 88 or an 89 point rating, because anytime something crosses the threshold of 90 points, it becomes a lot more expensive. Yeah. And you can find a lot of great values, and I would say this is going to be one of them. Uh, they come in at the 88 point or 89 point rating. They're going to stay 
under $20, uh, sometimes even under $10. And they're going to be almost, if it's going to be impercept, imperceptible as how between one of those and, you know, a $50 bottle. They're, they're that good and that cheap. And so I, I'm sorry. Yeah, a lot of times you, a lot of these wines will be a closeout, like maybe uh, there'll be a lot of reasons why they're just dumping a large batch at one time. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, 2006 might be a little too old. Maybe it's been, you know, sitting too long. Yeah. Um, but there are a lot of reasons for why there's a significant price drop. But regardless of what the reason is, the 2006 is phenomenal and uh, thumbs way up on that one. Yeah, yeah, that's a great, great value. Good find. So thank, thank you. So now the Montepulciano di Abruzzo. I still love saying that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eat that up the rest of the week. This is going to shock yeah, you. Just a splash. I'm going to clean this out. Oh, and don't forget a wine cracker. How much is this? Under $13. All right, you did it again. And another closeout. I looked it up online. That's an over $20 bottle, which is fascinating because I think we both agree that we like the first one better. I do. If, if I were to rank these, I would, I would drink the first one, and then I would drink the rosé. So this, this would actually be the last on my list out of what we've tasted tonight. Only because I don't think there's much character in this one. No. No. And I, I don't like the aroma. You get that, uh, that gamey barnyard smell, which, again, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's, um, it's, not, the, it's not what I want to smell when I'm smelling a wine. Yep. Well, since we're running a little short on time, I want to get to the rosé quick, because this is the drum roll, the big surprise of the evening. The Chilean 100% Cabernet Sauvignon from Chile. The base of the Andes, the roots of the Andes. Under five dollars. You're kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Under five dollars, my friends. I, big thumbs up. Uh, buy it and buy it in quantity. It's that good. They have about 16 cases as of today. I'm going back tomorrow and buying a few more. My not a case, but probably mm. half a case. Yeah. Just to keep in my basement. Yeah. Please, if this is still available, go to both liquor that, depots and buy this up. That's a steal. Regular price point in the 15, 16 dollar range. Jim, cheers, my friend. Cheers. I think this was great to do a blind tasting like I this. I loved it. Loved and uh, I think we learned a lot tonight. So thanks for joining us, guys. Once again, until we see you again, I'm Bobby P. And I'm James Kimbrough. And until next time, keep, keep us, us in your wine, wine cellar. cellar.